uh, depending on the slides already. So I cannot see the screen. Vale, no está en modo full presentation. Ok. Eh, ya estamos. Vale, tenemos sonido. Yes, sí, sí, lo sé, lo sé. Ok. So, good afternoon, everyone already in Europe. <laughs> Welcome. I, I have the pleasure, um, John and I, as chair and vice chair of the European Family Support Network. I'm Lucia Jimenez. I'm talking for the audience that is not here, that you know me very well. And John Canavan, Professor John Canavan from the University of Galway. And we are delighted to be welcoming you to this uh, open exchange series. Uh, organized by Eurofamnet. This is our first open exchange after COVID. So two things involved. One is that we are using technologies. So it's not only a face-to-face -face event, it's a hybrid meeting. So we are learning from the experience of COVID. We hope that technologies are working well. We have solved all the issues this morning. So we hope people behind the screen can hear as well, and please let us know if any technology happen. And also another issue related to COVID is that for us as an action, as a network, is our first exchange after two years and a half for online meetings. So for those that are behind the screen, we have been meeting for three days. This is the third day of very interesting interactions, very interesting meeting, very productive in, in a scientific way, but also very enjoyable. So I think I can talk in behalf of the, 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 the full room that is here, that we are excited, re-engaged and re-motivated. And this event is also re-engaging us with the society and with all of you, colleagues, practitioners, policymakers, researchers that are behind the screen um, were participating in this meeting. So let us please start um, saying that thank you um, there is so many people to thank, but I have to start say thank you to Professor David Herrera, that is uh, our exchange meeting organizer, because he is doing a tremendous, wonderful work to bring the work we are doing to with in Eurofam to society and to other colleges through these uh, through these exchange meetings, and also our virtual networking super manager Ana Pizarro, that is doing a, a great work behind the screen. Uh, thank you for sure for our local organizer, Cristina Nunes, and also their team, Katia Rodriguez and Laura, that they are supporting us and our technical supporter, Luis, that he has been <laughs> working hard this morning. You cannot see behind the screen, but they are also doing a lot of work behind. So um, uh, our college, David Herrera, will come later with more practicalities, but as you have been notified by Zoom, by Zoom this meeting is being recorded. So just for notice that the... Uh, not the chat, but the, the video will be recorded. Um, that means also that this will be available. So we will disseminate uh, through our website and probably through our cost channels. So we'll be available for further people to, to follow what had been discussed today. And my last thanks for sure come to the people that is here and that make uh, possible, made possible to be here, that are our colleges from working group two, particularly the leaders and co-leaders of the group, our colleague, Professor Carmel de Benet, who is here, and also Angela Bella Harris Churchill, that they are doing a tremendous work with all the with all the working group too in making this possible. And the two great panelists that we have together here, that is Helen Dan, that is uh, also these these are colleagues and and also high reputed uh, representatives in this case, the policy and practice area, and more at national level from Ireland. And we have also. Uh, making a good example of this hybrid situation, our colleague Agatha Dadato, who is behind the screen, not face-to-face, -face, so not in this table, but she's also here from Eurochild, that we, they will be acting as respondents. So what I can say is a very uh, exciting
Okay. Can you hear now? Yes, it's okay now. Okay. So this is real life now. This how life is going on. So I hope you didn't miss what well, what they say. They think was very well presented in the picture. So just saying that how the network is operating based on on cost. Um, support. And we wanted also to share this screen just to reflect the ambitiousness of the network that is not only in terms of the scope, but also in terms of its methodology. Uh, because you know that our work is placed in this intersection between research, practice and policy with the rise of children and families as the foundations, because uh, well, we are committed to co-create relevant knowledge and within the only way to co-create this knowledge that is relevant is effective is sustainable for people is doing in in this intersection and if this is the way we think that can make an impact in families um, lives and children's lives and this uh, exchange service is a good example of it a good example of intersection between research practice and policy and considering those rights as the basis so just this uh, general introduction, I'm giving the floor to John Canavan, who will keep going on. Slide. Next slide, David. So uh, hello, everybody. And uh, again, um, I hope everybody is doing well out there in uh, the internet world <clears throat> and people in front of me here uh, after our really excellent meeting. This graph just gives uh, an indication of the nature and scale of the work that we are involved in. Uh, we have five working groups uh, in the colored boxes in the center of the slide. Um, and I suppose there, the, the way in which we organize our work and through which we deliver the significant amount of um, outputs that we have been working on since we started uh, the action at the better part of three years ago, uh, with one year to go. So just to highlight, um, from this morning, we will, uh, or for this afternoon's webinar, we will be focusing on one of the areas of output, which is the conceptual framework. Uh, and it's really exciting to be at this point. Um, and again, Lucy has mentioned colleagues, but obviously we've colleagues who have been leading and driving work, looking at quality standards and evidence-based programs, looking at the standardization of um, framework for skills. And critically in this last period, and again, this is an example today, um, the dissemination of the results of our work and the sharing of the results so that people will use them uh, in real world uh, situations. And the group that I'm part of, again, with Lucia and other colleagues, the coordination group. But additionally, on the edges, and really we should have done more central, I think, when we redesigned this graph, is to pull in and refer clearly to the role of the policy and practice group, uh, comprising key people, inclusive of one of our respondents this morning, Helen Dunn and led by uh, Andy Lloyd and critically and what we've talked about a lot at our MC meeting and over the last couple of days uh, a, a young researchers group as we say broadly uh, early career investigators group which we hope will be the group that will drive forward the action when uh, some of us move on to maybe um, less busy lives in the future that's a long way away from me just yet I know but there you go so that's us um, I know people in front of me here know all this before but it's important for you to realize that really we will deliver key work in relation to conceptualization, in relation to programs, quality standards, evaluation approaches, and critically in relation to skills for family support work. So you could anticipate this action delivering and influencing policy and practice on an ongoing basis into the future. So that's me. To David. So we'll go to David now, who's going to do some just uh, the, the general setup for the rest of the um, webinar. Uh, hello, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Hello, everybody behind the screens and uh, everybody present in this room. Um, very briefly, um, just some instructions as the webinar is, is going to be hybrid. Um, 
just uh, just to let you know that uh, in, um, on the flyer we have this information with all the panelists presenting today. Uh, and I will introduce each one um, at the time. Uh, just to let you know that we are swapping the second and, and the third one. So first, first of all, we'll have um, Carmel Dibani uh, sharing the results um, made in the working group two. Um, afterwards, uh, will be uh, Agatha Dato uh, through a video, as she um, won't be able to be uh, was not able to be here, and uh, the, eventually um, uh, Helen Tam will be closing the presentations um, and we'll have some uh, interaction, we hope, after the, um, the, the three presentations. Um, after that, uh, just some instructions. Uh, people physically in the room, just uh, when uh, at the audience participation, please hand up and we'll um, uh, pass you the microphone to be here at home. Um, also for the rest and people at home will be um, uh, the interaction will be, will be through the chat. So please, people at home, um, just post your comments or questions on the chat. Um, Professor John Canavan will be the moderator at that stage and uh, uh, pass the, those comments or questions to the to the speakers uh, at the room. Um, so that's it. Uh, we're going to start now. Um, I'm going to stop sharing screen and introducing the first uh, presentation. So um, the first presentation is, as we say, is uh, the title is Child and Family Support in Europe, an innovative framework. And it's gonna be presented by uh, Dr. Carmen Debani, lecturer and academic director of um, Masters in Family Support Studies, Associate Di Director of UNESCO Child and Family Research Center and School of Political Science and so so Sociology, uh, um, Nui Galway. So Carmel, floor is yours. Thank you, David. So good morning, everybody uh, here in the room and uh, at home virtually. As David said, my name is Carmel Devani, and I'm uh, one of the leaders of Working Group 2, um, which, as John explained, is one of the uh, subgroups within Eurofamnet. And this morning, I'm going to present our work to date, which has resulted in a, a comprehensive, collaborative conceptualization of family support. Uh, I'll give some details at the end as to where you can find the full uh, briefing, policy briefing document, which contains all the work which has led to the uh, conceptualization that I'm going to present this morning. Obviously, I have 20 minutes, so I'm going to try and give you the, the highlights, the key messages in terms of uh, our work to date. But as I say, I'll give you the details on where you can find uh, the full report towards the end. So working group two, as, as John said, um, is one of the, uh, the subgroups within Eurofamnet. It's made up of 30 members, uh, approximately from a range of um, social science areas, political science areas, and also psychology. Um, and I suppose a, a number of the members in working group two have been involved in uh, developing and working on this conceptualization. In particular, I want to uh, note and pay a tribute to my colleagues, uh, Harriet Churchill and Angela Abela, who are co-authors of this report and uh, framework, um, and also the particular support we received uh, from Dr. Rebecca Jackson, a colleague of mine in NUI Galway in Ireland, uh, and also Mona Sandbank, one of the members of Working Group 2. So to date, um, we have spent a considerable amount of time, I suppose, really trying to have a, a rigorous and thorough process to think about how we can conceptualize family support in Europe. And I suppose essentially we wanted to have a broad, um, inclusive, but clear and focused conceptualization of family support that would really be of use to policymakers, to practitioners, to service providers, to, to students, to academics, and so on. So we've spent quite a bit of time, I suppose, really researching and, um, as I say, trying to produce a rigorous body of work to inform our, our framework today. We have three particular um, publications that have informed this work. The first, and you have them here on the screen, the first is um, 
a national report, which essentially um, is a compendium of reports on 27 countries within the EU, and it has looked at the policy and service provision within each of those countries. Um, we have a review of international and European frameworks and standards, so really trying to look at the policy, policy and legislative background and context for family support in Europe and what each of those frameworks and standards are saying in terms of providing support for, for parents and families. And lastly, we have um, completed an academic literature review looking at all of the relevant academic material and research material in terms of the delivery and the definitions of family support, the delivery of family support and so on. So we've taken those three scoping studies and really synthesized them and drawn them together, distilled all the key learning from those to inform our framework, which I'm presenting today. I suppose we've, we've, we, we've produced and, and developed what we're calling a multi-dimensional, multi-level framework for analysing, developing and promoting child, parental and family support in Europe. And again, we're taking, I suppose, a, a broad view of family support to include all the services, the activities, the provision um, that's in place right across the EU. And as you can appreciate, it's, it's, uh, it's a challenging feat to think about all the different contexts, all the different um, circumstances and arrangements that are there right across the different countries but we hope we've come up with um as i say a broad but clear and concise framework which, which will be of use to people and essentially where we're, our aim is that we're building towards a comprehensive support system which is inclusive and recognizes children's rights family welfare gender inequality and is very much informed by a social justice perspective So I suppose just to, I suppose, contextualize some of our work and to really think about uh, the complexity of family support, I suppose, is very much associated with the complexity of family and family life. And um, so we've very much informed our work by an ecological perspective and really trying to think about the social ecology within which children and young people live, within which families live. Um, and within that, I suppose, we've emphasized the fact that family is so important for children and young people and essential in terms of um, the development of healthy, positive, productive uh, citizens and, and civil society. And we, I suppose, very much emphasize and recognize the fundamental unit that family is and the role it plays in that. And we also, I suppose, emphasize the need to integrate um, the rights and frameworks that are there from the European Union and the Council of Europe and to really integrate them and, and use them to influence and inform how services are organized and how service provision is um, arranged and the infrastructure that's there to support that in the, in the various countries. And associated with that, again, we emphasize the need for a whole range of universal and targeted support services to respond to the the current needs of families, the realities that children and young people and parents are facing, and that associated with that, there's also material supports, again, to respond to the difficulties and challenges that are there for family life. So I suppose we're very much situating family and situating children and young people within this broader, complex uh, context within which they live. And so within that, again, we recognize the, the diversity of family and the increasing, uh, fam, you know, the diversity in family forms that are that are there today, the diversity in terms of the different types of need and the different types of issues that families and, and children and young people are facing. Um, and we also recognize the diversity within childhood. And again, you know, thinking about children today is different to how we might have thought about them 10, 20 years ago. And we recognize that, you know, childhood perhaps has been extended, uh, children are being, you know, they're living at home, they're dependent on parents for longer than maybe in previous generations. Uh, we recognize the digitalization of, of childhood and all of the positive and challenging issues that that brings with it, um, social exclusion and children's rights and the need to really recognize and inform family support and family support uh, provision um, in terms of the rights of children and also the rights of, of families and parents. And of course, as, as Lucia mentioned, we 
uh, are still in this recovery period, hopefully coming out of the pandemic. And again, we recognize all of the, the challenges, the inequalities, the particular difficulties that families have, have faced in terms of education, welfare, health, and so on uh, during the pandemic, and many which have um, you know, been exasper exacerbated during the pandemic, but, but continue to affect and create uh, particular challenges for, for family and family members. And we also recognize uh, forced migration and family separation, particularly in the context of the war in Ukraine and all the difficulties that that's bringing for families who are displaced and separation, separated and so on. Um, but also outside of, of Europe, uh, we recognize the, you know, the, the forced separation of families from outside of the European context. So in terms of, um, I suppose, we, the European countries as uh, signatories to the UNCRC and, and members of the European Union and the Council of Europe and so on, have established this imperative for uh, a rights-focused approach to providing comprehensive supports and services. So it's, it's I suppose it's a given that um, there needs to be this provision of support and this the provision of family support services. We also have a rich, I suppose, tradition of, of supporting families right across Europe uh, and diversity within the different approaches and orientations that are taken uh, in terms of providing that support. We have a whole range, thankfully, of advances in our, our knowledge base and our understanding right across sectors, you know, from a, an interdisciplinary perspective uh, in terms of what works, what, what makes a difference, what's helpful, what's effective and so on. Um, and we can put that to good use in terms of ensuring that services are effective and, and respond to, to needs in an effective way recognizing that there are gaps and there are, you know, limited synthesis across those disciplines and across those different sectors. Um, but at the same time, I suppose we're in a better place than we have been. We also align to that, have more collaborative approaches to decision making and service delivery. So again, thinking across sectors, across agencies, using this multidisciplinary approach, uh, we have a much more collaborative, coordinated approach. Again, not perfect, but better than where we've been in the past. Um, but in saying that, I suppose we have continued political, social, cultural challenges and um, constraints right across uh, the European Union and with, within countries and across the European context that continue to impact and, and challenge how we provide uh, family support and how we organize our services. So I suppose we, as I said, are, we were our, our aim was to provide a, a broad, inclusive, uh, comprehensive concept of family support that would be useful and would be used by, by policymakers and uh, practitioners and, and, and academics and researchers and so on. Um, I suppose we very much wanted um, we wanted clarity, we wanted broadness and inclusiveness, but we also wanted clarity. And we've distilled our work to come up with this, uh, I suppose, a definition or a description of family support. Um, and really, I suppose, referring to the social policies, the services and activities, which separately and collectively seek to support and enhance families, roles, relationships and welfare for all using a participatory ethos. And I'll come back to each of those, I suppose, particular components within that definition uh, as we go through the, the, the presentation. And our definition is very much informed by your fam Nets remit to optimize family support for children, for parents, for families, uh, and to recognize the range of support needs that they have at different stages throughout their life course um, and, and right throughout that right, the life course. And it incorporates the, the multiple types, approaches, and levels of supports and services which contribute to enhanced resources, capacity, and welfare. So I suppose we're very much informed by that overall thinking in terms of uh, how we can optimize family support as, as a, a positive um, resource for families. And we also recognize that it, family support is very much targeted at children and or children and uh, their parents and or children and their, their wider family. And again, we take a broad inclusive uh, view and definition of, of, of parent and of family. It includes a range of support, um, including economic, social, uh, professional support services, employment support services. So again, thinking about those material resources, those material supports, as well as the more maybe uh, traditionally thought of uh, social support, emotional support, uh, and so on. 
as I mentioned, it includes the, the universal and the targeted, but also the specialist supports and services. So we very much, I suppose, um, view and advocate family support across that continuum of care. Yes, having a, a role and an orientation in the universal services, but equally having a role and an orientation and applicability in the services that respond when there's maybe uh, you know, higher level of need, uh, there's higher levels of risk, there's need for protection, uh, and so on and so on. So really, I suppose, thinking about family support and its applicability across that range of, of care and support. Aligned with that is the orientation towards prevention and early intervention, but also towards um, remedial outcomes. And we include in our, our concepts uh, formal family support and the informal family support. So again, recognising the contribution of extended family members, of neighbours, of friends and communities, as well as the more formal organised services that are provided by professionals and practitioners. So in trying to take all of that information and all of those um, considerations, you know, and, and distill them, uh, we've come up with a multi-dimensional, multi-level framework for comprehensive, coordinated and collaborative, collaborative support systems for children, parents and families. And we've, I suppose, in, in short, we're calling this, this the four P's of, of family support um, and very much recognize the need for family support policy, provision and practice to be thought of in an integrated, coordinated way. And that really each of these activities and provisions um, they influence each other, connect with each other, inform each other and must be, as I say, considered and, and thought about uh, in a coordinated and combined way, and very much also informed by a participatory ethos, where we include parents, children, young people, but we also um, are inclusive of practitioners, uh, other relevant stakeholders, so that it's very much an informed and inclusive approach to thinking about um, policy, practice and provision. So in terms of policy, um, just to recap, I suppose we, we recognize and, and consider uh, the wide range of frameworks and standards and reforms for family supports rights um, that are there and that are very much informed by social justice and by a, a rights-based approach, but also take into account gender equality, um, the need for adequate funding, the need for high quality services and so on. So again, thinking about um, how policy really needs to work, I suppose, and contribute to adequate provision and good high quality practice. And in terms of family support provision, we include a wide range of uh, services, you know, that across, you know, that provide a, a wide range across types, level, levels of need, um, and right across sectors and so on. So thinking about the array of supports that any child or young person might need, that any uh, family or parent might need. And as we have here, very much about recognizing uh, diversity, promoting equality, and thinking about the different types of supports and services that families need. And we, I suppose, distinguish between family support provision and family support practice. And, you know, fundamentally recognize that family support is provided by practitioners in the main who are, you know, very high skilled, very professional in their approach, and that it is, uh, you know, a, a challenging um, a challenging role, a challenging task, and that there's a number of characteristics and qualities to family support practice that is, it might not be unique, but it's certainly very necessary. Um, and we think about the importance of relationship-based work. We think about the importance of strengths-based perspective and, you know, ensuring that we use the strengths-based perspective in day-to-day -day work. Um, we recognize that those relationships and that strengths-based work is done in the routine every day. It's, a, you know, it's, it's about the activities that practitioners get involved with with their their children the young people and and their families in those routine daily events and the difference that that can make uh, in the lives of of children and young people so we very much i suppose advocate um you know high quality key fundamental practice has been one of the cornerstones of of family support and aligned with that and as i said very much informed by a participatory ethos where we um you know actively include views and uh, response and feedback and testimony from children and parents. Um, but equally, we, we think about uh, view and testimony from our colleagues, from different agencies, from different sectors, from different disciplines, and take a joined up approach to thinking about how we can best ensure 
uh, a sound provision of family support. And as I mentioned earlier, we also very much see uh, the diversity of circumstances that families live in and are faced with on a day-to-day -day basis. We recognize the, the communities, the contexts um, that they live in and, and that, you know, are either helped or, or detracted, hindered, uh, you know, help or hinder their, their reality on a day-to-day -day basis. So we very much think about uh, family support in that social ecology and think about the, the provision and the practice within that um, social ecology and how it can respond to diversity at all times. So taking, uh, I suppose, that ecological perspective and taking our, our four Ps, we have developed, as, we, as I said, what we're calling the, the multi-dimensional, multi-level framework. And our intention is that, um, you know, policy going forward, I suppose, is, is, is recognizes and, and considers its role in determining provision, its role in supporting good high quality practice, and its role in, in ensuring that participation and inclusion is, is part of uh, how services and infrastructures organize themselves. So we aim to, I suppose, with this, with this uh, um, conceptualization, we aim to recognize that family support is wide ranging. It's influenced by the purpose, perspective and context within which uh, families live and within which service providers and practitioners are operating. It reflects the diversity of approaches and provisions within and across European countries. Um, it very much promotes coordinated interdisciplinary dialogue and development, engaging with that broad knowledge and evidence base that I um, referred to, and the, the knowledge and evidence that we have in terms of impact of the, the different approaches, the different programs, the different services that are there and, and what they're achieving or not. And overall, we aim to promote comprehensive, collaborative, progressive developments in family support services and systems, which ultimately improve uh, the well-being of children, parents, and family members. So thank you. Thank you, Carmel. Thank you to working group two, uh, Angela, Harriet, uh, all the rest of the members. Uh, you made a great job. And um, um, we, we just saw a uh, an, an amazing synthesis of all you, the work you, you're doing. So uh, um, thank you for that. Um, I'm sure that there will be many questions afterwards to, to discuss about that. So uh, I, I uh, take advantage to encourage people at home to post uh, comments or questions on the chat and uh, here in the room to uh, write down your questions and probably uh, share it afterwards. So now we are going to pass to move move on to the next uh, presentation. As we say, it's going to be a video by Agatha, Agatha Dato. Uh, unfortunately, she wasn't able to be here. Um, um, her presentation is called Fighting Child um, uh, Poverty and Social Exclusion, Challenges and Opportunities. Agatha Dato. Uh, joined Eurochild in 2008, and she has nurtured Eurochild's growing expertise in the fields of early childhood, family, and parenting support. She manages and coordinates the programmatic work alongside Eurochild's work on mutual learning and practical exchange. She is responsible to manage the first year's first priority campaign in a coherent, cohesive, and responsive way, co and coordinate the entirety of the work monitor monitor activities, implementation at both European and national levels, readjust the strategies design on the basis of emerging demands, needs and priorities. So now we're going to see the, the, the video. Please, please. If you cannot hear it, you should hear it at home, but if not, please let us know through the, through the chat, all right? Firstly, let me start by thanking the European Family Support Network for inviting Eurochild to contribute to today's event, which is focusing on child and family support in Europe and building comprehensive support systems. The multi-level, multi-dimensional framework that you've developed for family support is clear, detailed, and helpful. It sets out a way forward to develop family support policy, provision, and practice 
within a participatory approach for family welfare, children's rights, gender equality, and so social justice. As your child, we know the importance of ensuring better integration of services and ensuring an enabling framework that reflects the needs of all children, their families and communities. Significantly, the EuroFarmNet framework seeks to develop family support from children's and social rights perspective. In EuroChild, we have been advocating to end, uh, to end child poverty across Europe for almost two decades. And in this, in this slide, you can see the levels of child poverty in Europe according to Eurostat in 2020. Child poverty has a negative impact on children's lifelong development and can impact negatively on the economic development and long-term resilience of our society. Almost a quarter of children in the EU are at risk of poverty or social exclusion. The effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and the war in Ukraine are further exacerbating the situation. But at the level of the European Union, promising commitments to upholding children's rights and reducing disadvantage have been made. 15 months after the launch of the EU strategy on the rights of the child, the Council of the European Union finally adopted its conclusion on the 9th of June 2022. This is a milestone for children's rights as all 27 member states have agreed to these conclusions and should now implement the strategy. The strategy includes several elements that could make a real positive difference in the lives of children, especially those uh, who are most disadvantaged. It aims to protect and promote the rights of every child in the EU and recognizes that all children have the right to an adequate standard of living and to equal opportunities from the earliest stage of life. The strategy also acknowledges that families and communities need to be provided with the support necessary for them to ensure children's well-being and development. Although the strategy and the Council conclusions are not legally binding, they do have a political weight as they set the tone for the forthcoming national policies in children's rights. As such, these conclusions are important in our advocacy work to hold governments accountable to deliver on these commitments. The strategy recalls that all member states have ratified the UNCRC and that this must continue to guide all policies and actions with an impact on children. The EU adoption of the European Child Guarantee Initiative last year was a very important milestone. All EU member states signed up to this commitment in June. The European Child Guarantee requires all member states guarantee free and effective access to early childhood education and care, education and school-based activities, at least one healthy school meals each school day and health care, as well as effective access to healthy nutrition and adequate uh, housing. All EU member states are asked to develop national actions plans to set out how they will deliver their commitments to the European Child Guarantee. The deadline passed on the 15th of March of this year, and unfortunately to date, we've only seen 10 NAPs submitted. Eurochild established a task force of members to help advocate for the implementation of the European Child Guarantee Initiative. And uh, we set out a number of key demands. Firstly, we ask that each member state gives responsibility to a national coordinator who has the necessary power and resources to make a meaningful national action plan and its implementation. We are also calling that in the NAPs, priority is given to the children most in need and that member states identify and close the gaps in key services. Effective implementation requires collaboration and co coordination across ministries for an intersectoral approach. We also need better and more data collection and an effective monitoring and evaluation system as well as realistic but ambitious targets. We need more budget transparency in how member states are spending EU money 
on implementing the child guarantee. And we want to see meaningful, sustainable involvement of stakeholders, including civil society, regional, local, and other relevant authorities, and children and young people themselves. In January, we launched six country reports. Another means through which we are advocating for implementation of the European Child Guarantee is the first year's first priority campaign that we established in collaboration with the International Step-by-Step -Step Association, ESA. This campaign focuses on advocating for early childhood development to be a public spending and political priority. It focuses on children from uh, birth to six years with a particular attention on the first 1,000 days. We are particularly concerned with those children who are most in need, those living in extreme poverty, those of ethnic minorities, including, uh, including traveler communities and Roma, migrant and refugee families, and children with dis disabilities. The campaign is implemented by nine national organizations who are coordinating a national level uh, advocating for more cross-sectoral coordination of policies and the leverage of the EU instruments to drive change. It's particularly important that the European Social Fund Plus program has been asked to allocate resources to tackle child poverty. Member states with a level of child poverty above the EU average must allocate at least 5% of the RESF plus resources to address this issue. Even if these resources will never actually meet the full need to sustain quality services for children, families uh, um, and communities in need, we know that if they're used effectively, they can have a catalyst effect. And this is what we are trying to achieve through our campaign by scaling up what works and influencing national budgets um, in, the, in the long term. To create lasting change, we continue to work at national and European levels to create a virtual circle between grassroots activism and NGO services with national policy, legislative and public spending reforms so that all children can have the best possible start in life. Here you can see the vision of our approach to early childhood development. And we advocate for holistic systems which are supporting children in relation to health, learning outcomes, family support. In these nine countries where we are running the First Use First Priority campaign, we produced nine country profiles which look at data collected across six dimensions. So um, poverty, maternal and child health, safety and security, early learning, family support, and the level of cross-sectoral coordination of ECD. Eurochild has also pioneered a model that aims to capture systems-wide understanding of public investment in children and families, as illustrated in this figure. The con conceptual framework developed through child dynamics encourages analysis across the whole landscape of policies, programs, and services that have an impact on children, families, and communities. It proposes a way to map services and programs, not to create a rigid classification or typology, but rather to help understand how different investments are interconnected and can combine to contribute to different outcomes. Of note, this framework aligns very well with the Eurofamnet 4 Peace framework, which emphasizes the importance of all three levels within a participatory ethos. Within this framework, family and parenting support is also recognized as including a variety of provisions, including economic and employment support. Correct implementation of the child dynamics methodology requires horizontal and vertical collaboration among policy departments and across different levels of government. It provides a framework to bring policymakers together with other stakeholders, such as NGOs and academia, to work towards the shared goal of improving outcomes for children and families. 
The methodology also requires consultation with children and families. The measurement of outcomes can, however, be constrained by a lack of data, in particular longitudinal data, and the need to give due weight to qualitative outcomes. If you'd like to know more about our work uh, on advocating for the rights of children in Europe, please go to our website, uh, eurochild.org. Thank you for inviting Eurochild to, the, to be part of this event. Uh, well done for a really thorough and excellent piece of work. Undoubtedly, the Eurofam Family Support Framework developed by um, Working Group 2 will be useful in advancing our understanding and implementation of family support in Europe going forward. I wish you well in your future work. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, Angela. We missed you. Uh, we hope you, you were here. And uh, 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 that was an excellent and interesting presentation again. Um, um, we have to thank uh, Agatha and her team and Eurochild uh, for the excellent, for uh, being so kind and sharing with us uh, this presentation. So now we're going to move on to the third presentation. Um, um, uh, which title is Together for All, a response to the framework for children and family support in Europe, uh, building compre comprehensive support systems. Um, um, the person who is going to share with us is Helen. Thank you, Helen. Helen Tam uh, has a bachelor's degree. He's, she's certified, qualified on social work and has a master in advanced social work, uh, uh, qualifying social work for over 40 years. Uh, she has worked for a range of family and child care agencies across Northern Ireland in the statutory, voluntary and community sectors, designing, developing and delivering family support services. For is yours, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, good morning, everyone. And good morning to those online as well. Um, I'd like to thank um, Eurofam for asking me to respond to the work of Working Group 2. Um, as David had said, uh, my name's uh, Helen Dunn. I'm a member of Working Group 2 and also of the Policy and Practice Group. Um, a few months ago, I retired um, from my post as a professional advisor with the Department of Health in Northern Ireland. But in the intervening period, I've been um, asked by Children in Northern Ireland, an umbrella organization for children's services, um, to carry out a consultation with parents and carers in relation to a review of children's social care in Northern Ireland. Um, also for the last few months um, on a, on a short-term basis, I joined some frontline practitioners and um, working with children in the care system, as well as doing some voluntary work in the community sector. Um, I'd like to thank Carmel, um, Harriet and Angela for asking me to respond to their very helpful and comprehensive paper on policy provision and practice. And I'd like to draw on my recent work um, in consultation with parents and carers to inform my response. Um, but first, a little context of uh, where we are. Um, as indicated um, earlier, I'm based in Northern Ireland, which has a population of 1.9 million. Um, we have devolved government uh, from the UK in Westminster, although it isn't actually operating at the moment. Um, the Department of Health is leading on the development of a family and parenting support strategy, which will be implemented in a cross-departmental way. We also have five integrated health and social care trusts um, who deliver services, as well as a strategic partnership focused on collaboration and cooperation across statutory and NGOs um, to achieve better outcomes for children and families. Obviously, we have legislation and strategies, including a childcare strategy, anti-poverty strategy, and caring for children and young people in Northern Ireland strategy um, alongside that legislation. Um, I, um, having read the paper, um, decided that I would focus on four key areas in the framework, um, which Carmel has very helpfully outlined for us earlier, um, using the consultation with parents as the basis for my response. 
Um, first, it goes without saying the vital connections between policy, provision and practice um, are all interconnected and each informs and impacts the other. However, the test of each is whether or not it enriches the lives of children and families and produces better outcomes for children and families in the life course. Children's rights and human rights um, are crucial to all of this and an underpinning foundation of any of our work in family support. Um, and I, I think as well, the, the way in which um, the, the team who, who worked on this have been able to um, develop the comprehensive way in which multi-agency and multi-dimensional aspects of family support um, and the diverse range of supports that are in this arena has been very helpful. Um, and finally, as the framework highlights, um, the importance of engaging with children, young people, parents and families in policy practice and provision um, not only informs it, but also ensures that it's a fit for purpose um, in, in the real lives of, of children and families. Um, this is a list of the engagement with parents groups, which, which I've been conducting with a colleague. Um, we've been meeting with them as part of our review. Um, these are all parents and carers who have had contact with social services in the last five years. You will see that there's a broad range from prisoners' families to parents of children with disabilities through to women impacted by domestic abuse, parents with me mental health issues, and, and so on. You, you, you can see that on the slide. Um, most of the groups were face-to-face -face and a couple were online, which worked surprisingly well. Um, some were established groups and some were brought together for the purpose of the review. Um, for any parents that or carers that felt they would prefer a one-to-one -one contact or a telephone contact, um, that, that has also been arranged for them as well. Yeah. All of the parents and carers were very keen for their voice to be heard. They wanted to contribute, share their experiences and their insights. They wanted the system and services to be better for them, not just for them, but for other parents and carers as well. They were balanced in their feedback about what worked well, what didn't work well, and how things could be improved. Um, these are just a few of the things that, that they told us um, dur during those that I think resonate with the, with the key messages um, from the paper. So parents told us that the stigma and fear associated with asking for help often prevents them from doing so at an early stage. This was mostly in relation to contact with statutory services. The impact of policies, or at times lack of them, which doesn't address their material needs and leads to poverty and income and housing insecurity, particularly at the present time in relation to the cost of living crisis, negatively impacts their ability to care for their children. It creates additional stress and forces families to make impossible choices. Positive relationships and a big part of our family support work is relationship-based practice and, st and strengths-based. Um, positive relationships with those they come into contact with in provision and practice is crucial. These relationships need to be consistent, uh, timely, based on trust and respect. A parent said what they needed was someone who would help them walk alongside them um, to, to, to find their way around the system, someone to advocate for them. Parents also need to know their rights and they need clear communication in oral and written form. And that's what they told us. They also said that they need to be able to access specialist knowledge and interdisciplinary support as this is particularly important for those who've suffered from trauma, mental health difficulties, addictions, and domestic abuse. In relation to one group of women whose children were all in the care system, they developed very strong supportive relationships. They cried and laughed together. Almost all of them had suffered trauma, domestic abuse, and mental health problems, and were trying to rebuild their lives and not repeat the patterns of previous behavior. Access for them to the range of comprehensive supports was crucial 
and an advocate to help them to find their way to those services which would offer support to them. They, they also told us that some children require specialist accessible intensive support and that this should be made available. This was especially true for children with mental health difficulties or disabilities. And we know that coming out of the pandemic, this is especially important. Peer support from, with those who have lived experiences can make a huge difference. So opportunities for parents, carers to share with others who have, who have had similar experiences or been through similar difficulties was extremely important. Um, another project where women were victims of domestic abuse talked about how difficult it was for them to leave their partners because of coercive control. They didn't have the strength or capacity at that stage to make the changes that often workers expected of them. However, with the help and support of each other and the sharing of their experiences, they often find that that support was there. All of the elements of policy and practice and provision need to have a strong value base and that needs to center around compassion. The family support principles of accessibility, flexibility, partnership working, being needs led with strong informal networks and multi access pathways, which tackle social inclusion properly evaluated, all remain important. These aspects came through and they weren't described in that way as the, by, by parents and carers, but those were the things that really resonated of, of what they were looking for. Um, and easy access uh, to those services. This came through especially with a group of young mums who had had mental health difficulties and were caring for young, very young children. Um, and those were the key things that they were looking for. And then finally, um, and this is not a comprehensive list of everything that they told us, but just some things that I felt I should highlight that link very clearly with the, with the paper. Um, properly funded long-term family support can make a huge difference to the lives of families and produce better outcomes for children. Families describe the positive aspects services had on their lives, but they often worried about the short-term nature of them. And those where they were able to go back, having had support, were, were especially valued. And finally then, some quotes directly from parents. They said, um, I understand about child safety, often seen as a priority, but they need, they, meaning the workers, need to come in and work with parents and get this parent okay. And if this parent's okay, well, then the children will be okay. And that was a parent whose child had been in care and was returned to her. There was a theme that came through about mothers who had been the victims or survivors of domestic abuse about where they felt they were under the microscope and the perpetrator um, often wasn't treated in the same way. One observation from a parent facilitator was that there's too much assessment, surveillance and monitoring and not enough practical help and support. And another mum said, I know services aren't perfect, but this group is proof that change is always available and there's more good in the world than bad. It gives me a sense of hope, more knowledge, and over time, I hope the satisfaction I want. And that was a parent who attends a parent forum and who had suffered significant trauma as a child and was trying to care for her own children in a different way. So if I were to sum up what parents want, it is what one parent said whose children are in care. I just want someone to see me and to hear me. These are just a few reflections based on the consultations with parents and that connect to the, to the framework. But there's so much more that this framework has to offer as Carmel has very helpfully outlined and I commend it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, very touching. Uh, especially the quotes and the thank you very much um now we're going to open the floor for the audience so now we pass you the microphone john john is going to moderate um the the whole participation exchange and uh, so people at home please 
po post your comments, questions on the chat. Um, people here in the room, just hand up. Right. So anybody, first of all, what we will do is, uh, because we've got one microphone that's working, so if you do have a question, maybe just stand up and speak as loudly as you can, and I'll reframe the question for colleagues uh, online, okay? I think it'll be too much, it's too much. I have to communicate with the, yeah, yeah. So anybody want to start with a comment or a consideration? And a question for Helen or, Carmel. Yeah, so. So, so for the group online, just a, a straightforward question for Ellen, which is, um, is this work that she's presented uh, published and will it be available uh, to us? So for Helen. Okay, thank you, Lillian, for your question. Um, at this stage, we're still working our way through that process. Obviously, it's for a specific purpose, purpose which is to inform the review of children's services in Northern Ireland, but certainly something that we, we would think about going forward if, if people would find that helpful. Any other questions or thoughts? I mean, while you're thinking about that, perhaps I could maybe just uh, to reflect back to working group two generally um, on, the, on the framework. I think it's really nice. We now have the four Ps for family support. I think that's a, I think we've got something that, again, going back to our colleague Vivian's suggestions about what we want to do and how we want to communicate, we've got something quite uh, focused and clear. I think that's really, really nice. I think it's really nice to see the levels as well, I think is really, really nice. So I think we've got something at this stage we can begin to communicate effectively. So I just, from my own perspective, want to compl compliment working group two, uh, everybody who led, everybody who contributed to the work uh, and bringing it to this, to this point, which is a key, a key objective, a key output of the action. So, so thank you very much, uh, working group two, all colleagues, thank you. Maybe I can make up a couple of reflections in the meantime that people is processing the information because, well, I have so many, <laughs> but for sure, sharing now this uh, acknowledgement of all the work. First, starting from your presentation and the and the document that we know well, when I was rehearing you, because for sure, now I'm familiar with the document, I've been reading it. When seeing this together so close, when you presented this framework of policy, provision and practice and then the social ecology I think was the word for the for the um, let's say the situation of families I was reflecting about how they maybe the arrows could be also going in the different way you know I don't know maybe this is even explicitly written in the document but um, at, at the end it's also a ecology position that also and I think even for the um, for the purpose of our action, things in the way that also the messages are coming down to up and the and those uh, directions are multiple, we could say. So that's um, one comment that maybe Carmen want to to now to reflect on that. And I, and I had also one comment uh, related the, to Helen's presentation that I want to thank both respondents for interacting with our products. Um, and just probably it's more general and I don't know if there is any reaction behind, but just I think it's a very good lesson from my point of view as an action about connecting what we have done with the parent messages. So I would be really highly delighted, you know, to see, can we link any idea, not only of this product, but of any of our products, are we able to link with parents, with children and families? So. If we ask, because our our documents are not yet 
that well translated to say a group of parents, please read and give me your opinion. But, and we have parents representatives here, uh, so maybe they can also interact with this idea. But I, I'm, it was very inspiring for me, let's say, thinking about are we able to connect any of our actions, let's say, of our ideas with the views of the parents and families? And if not, what are we doing? <laughs> So that will be for me the, the, the lesson. So those are my comments and, and maybe you want to react. Thank you. What can I say? Thanks, Lucia and John. Um, and just to say, maybe I didn't make that quite clear at the beginning. So the process for us in working group two is that we have issued the draft policy briefing and the draft framework um, and asked members of the action for feedback on that. But Today's event is also, I suppose, part of that process, and we've taken the feedback from today uh, to inform the final framework. So it's kind of still a work in progress, although we're presenting it here today. Um, and I think we'd definitely recognise that even in, I think putting something on paper is one thing, but as we've talked it through and got it ready and really kind of, you know, tried to crystallise it to present today, uh, we've recognised ourselves that it needs a little bit more fluidity maybe and more directions even and, and more connections in it than it has done so far. So it's not a finalised framework and we'll be taking all the feedback from today um, and from action members in order to finalise it over the coming weeks. Um, just to say that I think there is so much richness in actually connecting the, the, the policy provision and practice that Carmel has outlined with the real lives of people that we work with in family support. And I think any opportunity we have to do that and um, to ask them what they think to get their feedback has to be an essential part, as, as Carmel has outlined anyway. Um, in, in any framework that we're doing or any su family support that we're developing. So, um, yeah, hope that answers your question. Yes, yes. Thank you, Helen. So maybe you speak. So we're going to get a question from Johanna from the floor, yeah? So for people online, just Johanna is, is acknowledging the work and maybe from an action point of view, it's this kind of work that we can now share with policymakers and practitioners and, and engage. Uh, and again, to see it nicely uh, beside the reality of the front line as Helen has presented and, and maybe using these things together in, in telling the story is, is the suggestion. So thank you for that, Johanna. I'm conscious that we're probably at the time limit for the uh, event. So I'm gonna hand it back to David just to maybe say a couple of words and then I will close the webinar if that's okay. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been uh, really inspiring, evocative uh, presentations. Um, unfortunately, uh, we would love to have more time, but unfortunately there are some circumstances that are, and we have to uh, finish here. Um, sorry for the technical problems, but uh, um, well, uh, we sort that out. And um, thanks to the people who fix it. Thank you very much. Um, um, thank you very much to the working group two again, 
an excellent job. It's uh, really inspiring, and uh, we we have so many things to learn from you. Thank you, guys. Uh, it's an amazing job. Um, no, well, Carmel, Agatha, um, and Harriet, but uh, all the rest as well. Uh, thanks to the um, Angela, I mean, and and thanks to the respondents, Agatha and Helen Tim. Thank you very much. Um, um, and thank you for everybody behind you all. So, so all your teams as well. So please say thank you to them. Uh, yeah, I want to say thank you to Christina Nunes and her team. Thank you very much, Christina. It's been amazing the days here. And thank you for the support to make this possible. Uh, I want to thank Luis as well. Thank you very much, Luis, for everything. And that was very kind. And uh, um, solving all the difficulties with this. So thank you very much. And um, I want to thank the exchange, the knowledge exchange team, Lucia, John, and um, Andy Lloyd, and everybody involved, and especially Anna Pizarro. Uh, thank you, Anna, very much. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, very especially for you. Also, Jean and Alvaro, because they are working behind, but uh, there is there are a lot of work behind to to make this possible. So thank you very much, and I'll pass the word to uh, the the microphone to to, the, to close that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll just we'll bring the webinar to a close, but with with the obvious big thank you to our colleague David uh, and David, should I say, and for all his work consistently on this exchange over the last number of years, and particularly today, such an important one. So thank you, and we'll finish with a thank you to David. Thank you. So colleagues um, in, 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 who are here, uh, just to say goodbye, and I'm going to have myself, Helen and Carmel have to go, so we'll be getting a, a fight. Lucia is just going to take one or two minutes to close the meeting overall, so take care and see you soon. Thank you for all the attendees. Thank you for all the attendees at the webinar. We are closing the webinar now, so the Zoom can be closed now. Ramos al webinar. Primero, sí. I have said. Okay. So just a few words for the formal closing of the event. I was thinking about. Thank you, Helen. Um, I'm moving from here because I feel alone. If I am the only one on the table, so I will be there. Maybe better for me. 